up getting a warrant of fitness for my MG, which is just going on the ramp by the sounds of it. And this is the local garage around the corner from me. Um, it's very rural based, obviously. And this is the place where old tractors come to die. So there's always lots of old tractors parked out the front here. All sorts of weird things. Um, I'd say most of them are too far gone to restore, but it's just interesting seeing what's here. There's not much left of this one. one's pretty gone as well I've got interesting names so, Alice Chalmers the decent looking one is called a Belcher Maxi apparently very interesting uh, this little one seems to be a BMC. This one doesn't look too bad. Don't imagine it runs. It looks like it's a diesel engine, I guess. Assuming that's diesel governs. I've never done anything with diesels, so I'm not really sure what I'm looking at there. Yeah, that's interesting. That's not part of the tractor. That looks like a cast iron garden ornament or seat base or something I don't know that's always interesting having a look up here anyway out in my shed again this is one of those films that's going to be little bits of everything my new magnetic strip turned up for my lathe and it turns out that isn't the problem uh, I think the problem is something to do with when this gets close to the sensor, uh, it's obviously not going to do anything now without a strip there, but when it gets into a position around about here and a little bit further on, that's where the measurement seems to get screwed up. If I move the strip along here, it still happens when this is in the same place. So I think what I need to do to fix it is move the sensor back. I've got plenty of room here, it's not ideal, I wanted to keep it all nice and close in, but I think all I'm going to do is make another one of these strips to attach the, the magnet to, and extend it out further and make a little bracket that this sits on to go that way, that uh, moves the sensor away, and hopefully that's it. But I'm going to do that after I fix another problem, which is... My MGB went for a warrant today, uh, that was all fine. I completely forgot to film any of the bits to do with replacing the rear suspension. I had the springs rebuilt, um, retentioned and reset, so the back of the car actually sits an inch higher um, because it was getting to the point where it was just bottoming it out too much over bumps and things. So springs needed redoing, they, they rebuilt them for me. It's not a big deal changing the rear springs on an MGB, it's pretty easy. Uh, the only trick I can offer is it helps to have a bottle jack under the middle of the differential um, or the nose of the differential because as you jack the car up, um, with the rear axle not sitting on the springs, it wants to tip down like that. So it helps if you can keep the nose up and then that makes it easier later on to put a, um, when you put a jack under it to lower it, it down evenly lower it down straight so that you can get the u-bolts through uh, if you ever have to do it it's pretty obvious but the problem i've got on the mg it didn't fail its warrant it was just a oh you need to fix this is ever since i built this car there's always been a slight knock from the front brakes um, usually you would hear it if you just put your foot on the pedal really lightly and i always just thought it was the rotor was a bit scraped or something like that um, but it's always been there and 
I started building this car tw over 20 years ago. And it's been on the road since 2010, so it's always been a problem. And uh, the mechanic I took it to for the wolf just up the road finally worked out what it actually is. And give me a second so I can get underneath there and we'll have a look at it. So this is obviously under the car. Here's my brake um, caliper with green stuff pads. I should probably check and see how much is left on those. Um, you can see, if I get in the right position, that this is bolted to the hub, two big bolts and a locking tab holding it in place. Uh, that's been there since I built the car, but for some reason, it moves. And that's the clonk. So I've no idea what's happened there, how that's happened, how that's managed to work its way loose when these bolts can't move because of the lock tabs. So very, very strange. So all I need to do, uh, he said I could do it. He said oh, I could do it. he could do it for me there, but I, I didn't want to hold him up any longer. It's easy enough for me to do. I just need to knock these tabs back, retalk these bolts, and put it back together. Uh, the other side is completely fine. So I honestly don't know how that happened. So I have modified this, moved it all out, made a new arm, made a little extension bracket, shifted everything out of the way, and it's still not right. And that's with a second new piece of tape. So, and you can see it's right around the area that you normally want to sort of be machining things that it's got an error. So if I slowly wind it out, back in goes negative again I have no idea why um, this does have supposedly a self calibration mode I've tried playing with that doesn't really seem to do anything um, yeah I, t I just don't know maybe it's just not very good um, it was cheap so Maybe that's the thing. Um, as far as I can tell, the other axis is fine though. So I really don't know what's going on with this or why it's so unreliable. Um, yeah, that's really disappointing. So it goes from 0 0.06 to what, 0.13? 0.15 so I've tried playing with the height I've tried playing with the the distance um, maybe this isn't parallel no it's just very very strange um, so maybe I need to look at a different DRO I've given up on the lathe in disgust and come back to the car and this is something that's been puzzling me the last few nights as I've been going to sleep I think about things and work out what I'm going to do and the problem I've got at the moment is the way this front panel goes I think what I am going to do is bolt this on uh, so it's removable the aluminium skin will come over the ash frame and wrap around the front and then this will sit on top of it. Um, the way it works is the there is no rubber strip originally. It was just bonnet lacing. I think it's similar to this stuff that gets screwed to this edge here. But this has to be lowered down. So you've got a layer of aluminium for the skin and then you've got the layer of aluminium for the body. So... Um, you also need the gap for that bonnet lacing. So that's about oh, nearly an eighth of an inch thick. So you need this set down 
the thickness of that bonnet lacing so that when your bonnet panel rest, rests on here it's flush with the rest of the body or, or as close as possible now the problem I've got is this is actually it's not square obviously the body tapers in and you can see that quite clearly here where this is cut square but it, it actually needs to be cut on an angle um, I can get the outside line just by scribing around it with a pencil I need to trim it a little bit it's pretty close but the problem is how do you get this line on the inside also given that that angle changes as you go around the body so this is the contraption I came up with it's my bendiest ruler with some plywood blocks and a pencil taped to it and the pencil point is right at the same height as the edge of this block and the way I can use this is I can rest this up against the body kind of like that but give it the right curve um, so I can bend the ruler to make sure it's actually the correct shape and then use that on this end to trace the line. Ideally, if I had a long enough piece of ruler or steel, I would um, take this line, this end, all the way back to the bonnet down there, but there's too many bits in the way and it's too long and that would be quite hard to do. So this should get me close enough and hopefully you can see that if, the, if this is bent correctly that that pencil should be in the right place to follow that line uh, you, you can you can see it quite clearly there and that should get me close enough and then what i can do is i can sand this to the correct angle um, to give me that sort of one eighth in step that I'm going to need to get everything flush. So you can see I've, I've traced around. Uh, the reason I need four blocks is because the things I'm tracing, I'm, I'm sliding it along, are in different places on each side of the car. And when I get up to here, it has to run along the top like that. So, and you can see that the amount changes as you go up the car because the amount of taper is changing it's quite interesting it's going to be hard to get that really really nice and accurate uh, and then this gets covered in, in aluminium up to here just flat i was thinking about wrapping it around um, but it doesn't look like they did that i think it was just left flat and then the strip screwed to this and then there's kind of an aluminium box that goes in here and you can make that in separate parts so you can make things removable so you can get to different bits of the car which is important later on for maintaining it um, but I think the best thing to do will be put some bolts straight through this into here uh, to hold that in place but keep them as separate pieces it's another day of all sorts of little bits and pieces it's a long weekend here so we had Friday off and I spent that time fiddling with the lathe a little bit. Uh, I've come to the conclusion that these just aren't very good. So all of the bits of strip I've got seem to have errors in them and they're just not accurate. They're just not good enough. So I'm going to call that a failure. Um, I may look at getting some optical scales for this. I you could use these if you're not looking for huge amounts of accuracy so maybe to a millimeter or so um, i was figuring out I was, across a millimeter i was getting in some places 10 percent error and for a lathe like this that's way too much so it was fun playing with it but uh yeah i'm glad it was cheap so i, I wasted more time on it than i did um money so you live and learn uh, like I say, if this was to go on a drill press, say, it'd probably be fine if you're only looking for down to the nearest millimeter. Um, I'm not going to bother putting it on this yet because I've got the mill if I ever need to do any precision drilling. So I've put that aside for now. Uh, the MGB is all fixed. Rear springs are on. Front brake caliper is bolted on. I still don't know what would happen there, but that did get rid of a slight clonk that i've had ever since i assembled the car so it's always been like that 
Um, I guess maybe it got worked a little bit more loose over time. It's probably been moving slightly, so uh, that's all fixed now. I took the MG for a nice long drive yesterday, got it nice and hot, worked really well. Uh, it's amazing how much just an inch difference in the rear springs has made. It no longer bottoms out on some of the roads around here. Um, it's actually going really, really well. So that's all back on the road, warranted, all legal. Um, the Landy, I thought I'd give it a an oil change. I fixed the um, the vacuum hose that went to the vacuum advance that I'd replaced a few weeks ago. So that's all done. I'd bought some oil for it and um, thought, oh, I'll just give it a quick oil change. I ended up um, degreasing and water blasting the engine. It's still filthy though, um, especially around the back of the gearbox. There is thick, thick layers of dirt there. And it seems that the, the degre degreaser you get these days just isn't very good. I was just using the super cheap stuff because it's, it's cheap and it kind of works. But um, I don't know, none of these chemicals seem to work as well as they used to. I think they take out all the, the good stuff from them these days. But it's a bit cleaner, so that was good. Um, I had a really hard job getting the fill plug out of the bottom of the sump because that had obviously been tightened up by Magilla Gorilla last time it was done. I don't know when that was. Um, I do have documentation that shows before the car was sold it was serviced at, I think they're called Armstrongs, who are supposed to be a Land Rover dealer, I think. So you'd think they'd know better, but no, it was done up so tight I ended up having to use heat um, to be able to get that undone. And similar with the, fuel, with the um, oil filter, that was just on this way, way too tight and I ended up whacking a screwdriver through the side of it and using that as a lever to pull that off. So I did all that. Um, I also replaced the fuel filter. It looks like that's never been done. Uh, I had a, a heck of a job getting the bracket off. Um, I ended up sort of down behind, just in front of the rear wheel there. Uh, I had to use a pry bar to get the wheel off because it looks like they haven't been off for ages so it was kind of stuck to the hub so I had to prise it off and a job that I thought would take me a couple of hours ended up taking all day by the time I was done but the Landy is now back together it's got a new air filter as well um, I'm hoping all of that and the new vacuum advance fixes my terrible terrible mileage uh, the other thing I discovered on that engine is it's the 3.9 V8 uh, there's two versions of that there's a low compression and a high compression and I thought New Zealand got mainly low compression ones but this car was probably a Japanese import one and it turns out it's got the high compression engine so I need to put at least 95 octane fuel in it I was putting in 91 um, didn't seem to be pinking or anything but uh, it's probably better on the higher octane fuel. Uh, the other thing I'd fixed on that is there was a weird, it's hard to describe the noise, but a sort of almost like a ticking noise that would come when you were under load, under um, heavy throttle. And it turns out that was a, a leak between the manifold and the exhaust. Uh, the bolts had just come loose. So I tightened those and that's fixed that. So the Landy's working well. I uh, haven't done anything with the lamps yet. I've been looking at my gauges. This is the cheap Indian Smith's uh, mechanical taco thing. What I was hoping with this is that I could reuse the mechanism. So I pulled it apart. Uh, these things, unlike the originals, the, the rings are crimped on. They're you can get them off without damaging them. Uh, I didn't bother with this one because this gauge is junk. And the reason why it's junk is it's just not accurate at all. It's not even close. Um, it may be actually a four to one instead of a two to one, but even then the numbers are, are quite a bit off. So this just doesn't work. Um, it was useless. So the way these work is it's kind of like a magnetic drag type thing. So this outer cup is driven by the cable and that kind of drags around the the needle um, at a speed proportional which is why if you if you wind the needle up and let it go it goes back slowly because of that drag but 
I had been hoping I could reuse uh, use this and make a new face for it and it would be good, but no, these, these are just junk. I wouldn't bother with these at all. So I've been looking at my gauges and this is still my best bet. This is a proper Smith's one. It's just a bit more industrial than I would like. And of course it's a, a white faced gauge. I really want something that matches these. Um, I did think about, could I repurpose my Speedo to be a rev counter, because really that's all it is, but the ratios are wrong and it wouldn't um, show the right values. Uh, if you, you did the scale, um, even if you work out the scale and the two to one ratio, it's just all wrong. So what I'm going to do, I think, is because I've got had a few of these, I've got some bits left over. And this one was actually left over from my Austin 7. So this is an old Speedo casing. Uh, it's a bit different where the, the, the bezel doesn't come off. It's all part of that unit. So what I'm thinking of trying to do is taking this gauge. Whoops. Um, it unscrews from the mechanism so it just needs a flat back and basically making a new back for this uh, I'm not sure what out of yet um, to be honest I could probably even 3d print something and I can make a new face for this I've done that before with my Austin 7 I don't know where I've put that Uh, you can see I've got all sorts of gauges. As soon as you've got a drawer of these things, I think they start breeding and multiplying because I seem to have an awful lot of oil pressure gauges. But somewhere, I don't know where it's gone, um, but I was actually able to etch a nice um, panel. So what I'm thinking of doing is I'll try that again. I etched it from aluminium. Um, I basically drew up the design, printed it in reverse on some glossy paper, you run that through your laser printer and then you you basically iron the toner onto the aluminium plate and then you can etch it with acid and that worked it came up really well uh, I had it this morning I've been slowly trying to clean up a little bit in here because it's getting messy again there. as you can see I've got even more gauges in there um, I wish I could use an oil gauge like this, but this only goes up to 40 psi, and the Riley runs more than that. So um, this is probably the ammeter I'll use. And, uh, I don't know where that's gone. Anyway, it's possible to make new faces. That's not a big deal. And this gauge, because it's mechanical, it only reads to 4,000, but it'll actually go all the way around. So that's about 5,000 RPM up to here. So I'll remake the gauge and I'll have it go to 4,500, which I think is, you know, this isn't a really highly tuned racing engine or anything, so that should be fine. Um, and then... This is the oil gauge I will use. Um, so the idea will be to, to make a new face for this. It just screws on and put that in here. Uh, I can make a black face, paint the needle uh, white to match this and make a gauge similar to this, but just a, a plain rev counter that'll go in there. The one thing about using this style of gauges though, is if I use a timber front panel, it's too deep and you end up um, blocking the light things. So this is why these really early ones have this beveled glass. And I think the bevel is there to get light onto the gauge from the front. So that's how that works. Um, I've got a clock. I did start trimming this and just mocking it up and it's come undone because of the tape. So you know, it ends up looking something like that. These are just temporary positions of where gauges and things could go. Clock on the far side. Um, it'd be really nice to get one of those, uh, I think they're called time of trip clocks, the sort of fancy ones with stopwatches and things built into them, but uh, those are ridiculously expensive. So I'll probably just go with that eight day clock for now. 
Uh, the Speedo, I have ordered the correct cable from the Riley Register Spares, that should be on the way. Uh, what else have I done? Uh, some other parts I ordered have turned up, so these are things for later on. Uh, door catches, a couple of mirrors because I don't know exactly what sort of mirror I'm going to need yet. It just clamps onto a like a stalk. Um, this one actually goes off, it's a side mirror and that would go off, be attached somehow to the um, the little fly screen. And what else are we doing? Um, I've trimmed this down so I know how this goes now. I was pretty close to how it works. I think what I'm going to do is have the front panel wrap around as I say. Um, this will bolt through and the way it works is there's an, the, and the aluminium box only comes up to here. This isn't covered in aluminium but I have seen some cars where it is. Uh, and then that comes down and you make that in multiple parts. So what I've done now is I've gone far enough. I've sanded this onto the right bevel and I just check that with my bendy ruler. Um, it's just a matter of doing that by hand on the on the sort of belt linisher here. You just do a little bit, take it off, test it. That works fine. But as you can see at the moment it's flush. So what I will do next is um, I'll probably drill the holes through, but now that I've got the correct angles on these, all I actually need to do is take a fixed amount off. And that fixed amount will be basically the, um, the thickness of this. So it uses webbing like this, but slightly wider. It'll be the same width as the plywood here. Um, I went to Super Cheap and they had a sale on, and I got this nice little little tiny square so this is half inch pretty much oh, it doesn't have inches that's annoying I hadn't actually noticed that but yeah that's half inch 12 mil 12 and a half mil uh, so effectively all I need to do is um, take off an equal amount and that's dead easy. I just use a, a pair of dividers or a compass and mark the same width on both sides to give me the line to sand down to. And then that provides the step. So the aluminium, let's see, 1.6 mil aluminium. This is going to come round and be hammered round and pinned to the front. So this will come in there. Hopefully I can get a nice tight um, corner on there. And then this will be trimmed down. It's already a little bit low in the middle. And we'll have the, the bonnet lacing screwed down to it. And so that the bonnet will sit flush. Or as close to flush as I can get it. So you've got 1.6 mil there. And the bonnet there but sitting on the webbing. Kind of like like that that's the idea anyway and that should get it all nice and flush as i say the the box in here is done in different sections so you can remove it easily get it around the steering column and things like that so this is probably it's getting pretty close to being able to drill the holes through it where that'll bolt in place So I have the firewall bolted in place, well, which isn't really true. I've just got lots of holes drilled and there's a couple of bolts holding it um, just loosely at the moment. Because I don't have the right bolts, these are just uh, M6 at the moment, but I'll get quarter inch BSF for it. Um, and I just got tried to get the bolts spaced nicely and also in positions where you can get to them. So you can get to all of those in the inside of the car. And what I'm going to be doing down the bottom here is there's still the bracketry that needs to be made to go in here. And I've made that so that um, on this side it can bolt to that steel bracket. This is also going to have a piece of steel this side which is where the hinges will attach. 
so it should be good um, the other thing I did was to drill those holes I made up a little guide block because apart from this face nothing is square on the frame so to make sure the drill went through straight I used this block and I ended up having to use my little right angle drill again because on the um, on the near side of the car the exhaust gets in the way so I needed that to to get into those lower two bolts so this is now effectively flush with the um, with the frame and it's angled correctly to meet up with the bonnet because the um, the bonnet sides are effectively flat there might actually be a, a very slight amount of crown in them so that they don't look flat so that's one of the problems if you make something look flat it'll look too flat and it'll look wrong so sometimes you need just a fraction of a piece of crown a little bit of a curve and then it looks right um, that's kind of one of those weird things with 3d shapes and cars like this so I think the next thing I need to do is actually order the fender strip so that I know how much shorter I need to make this the angle is now correct so it's just a matter of taking off a parallel amount um, unfortunately I can't do that with a router or anything clever like that because the angle changes as you go around so I'll just have to mark a line either side and then and then hand sand it but it's actually not too hard doing that I believe that strip should be about an eighth of an inch which means this would need to go down only about a sixteenth because once you've got the uh, not a sixteenth it'll have to go down an eighth because you've got the 1.6 of the body the 1.6 of the bonnet panel and then the thickness of that that um, strip in there I'm pretty sure it's about an eighth of an inch thick but I'll order it first so that I know exactly how much to take off uh, so that's looking good there I still have the back of the car off because I'm still trying to figure out how to do these rear diagonals it's actually quite hard for me to get just a short section of two inch square 50 millimeter square box section so I'm wondering if it's just easier for me to make that um, from thicker steel so I've got some five millimeter instead of three millimeter what I'm wondering is if five millimeter across there with the ends bent up so it can bolt in is going to be strong enough um, I think that should be probably as stiff as three with the edges bent down possibly not but um, I don't believe those pieces are critical they are original the original cars did have those but you see a lot of cars that don't have them and it probably doesn't make much difference and I was also looking at the cross member that goes across here uh, that one gets a little bit tricky because it has to clear the brake cables so it's going to need a little bit of a kind of a curve in it to get around under there and it'll probably just bolt to the chassis rails there that provides the the back edge for the front of the the aluminium box that comes up for the bottom part of the firewall it also provides me a point to put the um, clutch return spring so I've got a mounting for it there I just haven't actually put it in there um, because I've had, there's enough weight on this that it keeps the pedal down but to stop it jumping around I'll, I'll put that return spring there and that'll just keep the the pedal in position um, I had to put towels all over everything so I didn't get sawdust in the back of the gearbox and into the starter and that's uh, come up all right so I think as I was mentioning before with the instrument panel I may end up making that from aluminium um, I prefer the aluminium look just plain aluminium I don't know it's it just seems a bit more purposeful than the mahogany um, so there's my mahogany board I may still have a go at actually widening that because that's not wide enough to make this panel at the moment so I might might try playing with that and gluing that together uh, I mean the other thing you could probably do is you could cheat and you could use an aluminium panel so it's nice and thin but but pretty rigid and then veneer it uh, I've never tried that but I'm sure there's no reason why you can't 
uh, let's see where we're up to so the firewall is bolted on I'm gonna order the the fender welt stuff uh, so I know the thickness before I trim that down but the bolts are all in place I've been working on the instrument panel that was my cardboard template I've cut out a piece of aluminium I was really just doing an experiment I just wanted to to start making something but it seems to be going well so I'm continuing I ended up cutting up one of my old Austin 7 aluminium bonnet panels it was one of my first second practice go at making the integral hinges um, I've had several of those panels lying around I'm reusing the aluminium I'm going to reuse other parts of it to make the fuel tank ends uh, but I've been trying to figure out I came out with a nice shape uh, there's room for a clock and all the gauges uh, the cutouts the right size but I was trying to figure out the best way to finish the edge and I did play around with bead rolling a sort of round edge these are just rough I wasn't being too careful I just wanted to see what it would look like but I don't really like that kind of look so that's using these kind of dies so the next thing I was going to do is just do a folded edge just to give it a bit of stiffness and usually when I do folded edges I use my my bead roller and I use this homemade die it's just a piece of three mil steel and um, usually I just put a slight score in the metal and then fold around that but what I found is if I really crank down the pressure I can actually roll a very thin bead and then hammer the edge around and that gives me just the fraction of a step on the edge and lets me hammer around that 90 degree bend again this was just a rough test uh, so that's what I'm going to do because it gives a very subtle edge to the bottom of the panel but it really stiffens it up so I think I've shown my bead roll before I'm sure I've done films on it um, I motorized it with a windscreen wiper motor and just a bicycle chain and sprocket you really don't need a big motor uh, what you're after is torque and there's just a simple speed controller circuit with a, a reversing switch and a speed control and I have a, a foot pedal and I find the foot pedal is really useful because um, that lets me manipulate it with two hands the piece of metal it makes it really really easy and the other thing you can do is when you're going around curves you want them to be as smooth as possible you can sort of pulse it and and get nice smooth curves like that so the other thing I did to make it easy to to do that is I um, anneal just the edge of the aluminium and I can show this we get that in there not like that it's a bit hard with one hand just a second so if I was using oxyacetylene I would use that and what you do is you use the acetylene soot and blacken it but you can also use sharpie so if you just put some marks on it like that um, I just did it with map gas When the sharpie burns off it's annealed uh, that works really well that's very simple uh, you don't have to let it cool down of course because it gets hot but I have gone ahead and done that that edge uh, it's a little bit wonky I went a bit wonky in the middle here but it's handmade so what I'm going to do now is hammer this around 90 degrees to give me that that nice bottom flat edge and we'll see what it looks like I've folded up the edge on the panel um, one of the reasons it's always good to leave extra when you're doing that is because to get around the the folds of course 
when you're folding like this, you have to uh, shrink the metal, and then when you're folding this way, you need to stretch it so it'll come round. And that ends up meaning your edge goes, becomes different widths. Maybe it's just I've got bad technique or something, but that's what I find always happens. So you can see it's a little bit lower here um, because the metal's had to stretch, so it's pulled it in. And it gets fatter here because um, you've sort of shrunk it in, if that makes sense. It's, it seems a bit counterintuitive, but that's what I find always happens to me anyway. So I always leave the flange bigger, and then what I will do is make sure the panel's flat, put it down on a flat surface, trace around, and then trim to that line to get it an even width. But what I've discovered with this is um, I can run it through the roller again. Now that I've folded the edge up, the edge got you lose a little bit of definition on that little lip but I can actually run it through here again and it just sort of pulls itself through because it's got such a deep groove it just follows the corner um, you can see with my foot pedal down there it just kind of traces around and it just re puts in that little edge after I've been hammering it that little um, that little lip probably stop there I don't want to push my luck trying to do it and film it at the same time but I can go through and do this a few times and it'll it should give me a nice a nice detail just on the edge where it folds around so this is how the instrument panels come out I've taken it outside and I scrubbed it down with a scotch bright it's still a bit wet uh, it's okay it's not perfect but and I've got a bit of a, I don't know if that's actually a split. No, it's not a split. It's just quite a deep groove just at the bottom there. Uh, it's not perfect all the way around. It gets a bit light just in that corner. But I'm pretty happy with that. I think that's come out all right. Um, I'll tape it up to the car and see what it looks like. That tape is barely holding it in place. But um, it's not sitting quite right. But that gives the idea. And the edges, I did sand the outside edges a bit to get these smooth. Um, underneath here, I haven't bothered so much because you can't really see the hammer marks. But I did smooth up these because you'll see those when the doors are open. But they'll actually fit in there like that. It's just kind of hanging on the tape at the moment. And you can see there's plenty of room there to get your hand up inside up and reach the reach the gear lever and the handbrake switch panel there tachometer probably right in the middle there speedo and other gauges um, yeah and I think that that little lip on the lower edge just finishes it off without it being too much like if I'd put a, a full bead roll there it would have looked would have looked like someone had put a full bead roll there I guess um, this looks a bit neater and there's no sharp edges so yeah I think that'll work um, I'm gonna have to figure out how to attach it I could put just put two screws through there into the timber but I think what I'll actually do is make some little brackets that go on the back and it gets attached up here just a few little brackets sort of along the top there that's kind of how it looks from the inside yeah as I say I wasn't planning to make an instrument panel today but that seems to be what's happened I haven't made the diagonal pieces yet um, I've got a, another idea of what I can do there instead of using angle I mean channel I can make it from three mil and then I will weld on the bottom of it a, a little strip of angle probably this stuff and if that's welded along the bottom of it that'll stiffen that up and that should be um, that should be fine for those those pieces under there um, that'll make that all nice and strong and the other thing I've done is I've made the cross member that goes at the rear that the fuel tank sits on top of. So that's another piece of angle. Uh, it's quite thick. I think it's four or five mil thick. 
Uh, I may end up drilling some holes in it to lighten it a bit because it's quite a hefty piece of metal but it does have to support the the petrol tank which when it's full will be about 30 litres of fuel so what's that 20 something kg 28 25 something like that um, petrol's a little bit less dense than water but um, you know there'll be a good 30 kilograms sitting on that which isn't really a lot and I think the way I'm going to do this so I've drilled holes so I've welded nuts onto it so they're captive um, these are 3 8 bolts that go through uh, these ones are too long I need to get a whole bunch of bolts I need to start thinking about what I need to order from the UK but that'll bolt in there permanently uh, I'm going to make metal straps that come across here and then loop over this I'll just sort of hook over um, probably just three mil steel uh, they'll just hook over that and I'll have wooden blocks made from ash I've got lots of leftover ash that'll be the cradle shape for the petrol tank to sit in because that needs to be within the chassis so that'll sit up kind of like that it's within the chassis rails the fuel filler goes on the other side so it'll sit on top of that and then what I will do is I will make a, a strap um, maybe with a tensioner I'm not sure that wraps around this it's actually bolted around this so it can't come loose and that'll go up and over and down and bolt onto this angle here and that'll strap the, the tank down so the tank will be very very securely fixed into the chassis and I'll probably make a little aluminium panel that goes in there, a little floor. Uh, there'll be another one that goes underneath here, but I'll probably keep that as a separate piece because it's quite handy to remove that if you ever need to get into the diff. Uh, so that'll kind of separate that off and the tail will have a, a floor as well. Um, the other thing I did is I've got my temporary instrument panel well, my actual instrument panel now, I guess, in place. And I cut up the temporary one, uh, the cardboard one. I cut out the dials and they're just stuck on with tape. Um, it's not just so you can sit in the car and make brum brum noises. It's actually so that you can figure out the position of all the instruments so you can see everything. So this will probably move around. It always takes a little bit of fiddling to get this right. Uh, you see some cars have instruments everywhere like Bentleys the racing Bentleys have instrument panels just covered in stuff I'm trying to go for the minimum um, I may be able to get rid of one of the gauges as well so this is the main switch panel that has the starter button and the lamps um, there'll be the tachometer there oil pressure there and water temperature there those are the main instruments those are the important ones and then over this side I will have the speedometer, the ammeter, and a clock. And in the middle there, there's the push-pull switch, which is this one. Um, that's the uh, magneto kill switch, so that's how you shut the engine off. And you have to pull that out in order to start the car. So that'll be up here, and the other one is for the choke cable. I think that's all the controls I actually need. Um, the one I'm wondering about is the ammeter because if you run an ammeter you need to run effectively all the current except for the starter motor has to go through the ammeter so you need a really thick wire to go to that and then to all the other instruments but given there isn't a lot of electrical stuff on this car just the lamps and I'm going to be using LEDs for those there won't be a huge amount of current draw so I'm not even sure I need the ammeter um, maybe it would be good enough to swap it with a voltmeter just so i know that the dynamo is charging um, chances are with the, with a car like this i would always carry a, a a battery charger with it so that i could um, top up the battery and not be relying on the dynamo which i'm sure i had the dynamo working before but the last couple of try times that i've tried it it wasn't actually producing any output so it may need reflashing um, Maybe I did something wrong when I rebuilt it, but like I say, I definitely had it generating at one point. So I need to look into that, but for a car that's not gonna be used at night, probably, 
um, you know, running off the battery. You can run off the battery for a long time. The only other thing that is powered in it is the electric fuel pump. So I may want to switch for that. Uh, if I can find a suitable switch, I could put another switch in here. Just, just so you can turn the fuel pump on and off. Uh, and I think that's kind of it. So once I do these diagonal pieces, I still need to do the one at the front. Uh, that's going to be quite fiddly to make. It's going to need to be bent or cut out. It has to go under the bell housing, clear all the brake cables and things, and bolt into the side of the chassis. But uh, that'll be next. It's getting quite late in the afternoon now. Uh, been quite busy. It's been quite a busy weekend. It's been a three-day weekend. But I've got quite a bit done. I'm fairly happy with that so far. Uh, I think once I have all the cross members in place I'm going to do a big order for all the nuts and bolts and bits and pieces I need um, from the UK and then I can I, I'll know I'll be able to bolt everything down and what I'm actually thinking is before I do the skinning um, I might strip the whole car down and paint the chassis um, it'd be quite nice to be able to start putting this together permanently so, for example, things like this one, once I've figured out all the, the holes and things I need to drill for mounting the, the fuel tank, that can go in permanently. You know, that probably won't come out again. And it would be really nice to, to be able to start bolting things into it properly. The only tricky bit there is the, um, the, where the seatbelts mount. And I'm pretty sure if I'm reading the rules correctly, I will need... I will need to use these doubler plates. If I didn't use these, I would have to, um, I would have to weld suitable nuts directly to the chassis. Uh, whereas if I do it this way, I just need to drill some holes. And you have to use monol rivets, apparently, um, which I had to look up. So apparently monol is a, a steel, I think it's got nickel in it. So instead of aluminium or stainless steel pop rivets, you use these, these monol ones. Uh, they look really expensive. I'm not sure where I can get them from. I've just seen them in, you know, 100 batches. Uh, the other weird thing is I'm pretty sure it says you have to use four rivets or no more than four, even though there are six holes. So not quite sure how that works. But I'm thinking these will go probably in here somewhere because I can get to it all. Um, in order to mount the things, so they'll sort of go in like that. I think that'll work. And that gives me the place to uh, to bolt the seat belts to. And yeah, the instrument panel, I will need to make some little brackets that probably screw into here and fold around, um, fold in and down and give me a little lip there. Um, I'll probably make those from steel so that I can thread them so you don't need to worry about nuts and bolts. I'm trying to use captive nuts or threaded plates or things like that as much as possible so that it's easy to take the car apart. Uh, you don't really want to have to be putting a, a bolt through this side and having to get a nut on the back of it when you could just have a metal plate with a threaded hole so you can just put it up and screw it, screw it straight into it. Uh, that's my, my thinking there. The other thing I need to do is I will have to think of a bracket to just to support the top of the steering wheel um, that will, will attach to this somehow. So again that might be part of that bracket that holds the for the instrument panel but it needs to be done in such a way that I can still mount the instruments there. So there'll be some sort of strap or something that goes down. Uh, the other thing I could do is put it across here maybe. If I put something from here across to here and then I can triangulate it down to the steering column and that gives me all that room in there for the gauges. You can see they're, they're not that deep. Um, you know, I think they stick out sort of that far. And yeah, that, it'll be good if that can be adjustable, that mount. 
which shouldn't be too hard to do. I think I just really need a strap around the column and something coming down here, triangulated with a, a flat piece, and I can bolt that strap to it, and I can put multiple holes in it because the steering column pivots. So you can adjust it. You can move it up and down a little bit. You can see I've left a little bit of adjustment in the panel there um, just to make sure you get it at the right height so you can actually get underneath it. It's, a, it's at about the right height now. You know, if I moved it, if you lift it up, it's probably another half inch there. You know, this will move up three quarters of an inch, but you don't want it too high. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's it. I do need to think, I'm probably going to have to mock it up when I make the little, the little straps that come across and hook over that, if I can still get that out with those straps there. I think I can. I think you should be able to undo the bolts and lift that up and then move that out because because these are tapered of course so this is fitted in as as far forward as it will go it's sort of almost jammed in there um, but I'll figure that out later in the week I guess just put the tail back in place just to make sure the bracketry is all going to work um, may end up making the fuel tank fractionally shorter but it just clears at the moment uh, one thing that could be a worry is, oh no, I think I, I know how I could prevent this. I was just thinking if you've got the guard stay in there and you get whacked in the side, it could theoretically puncture the tank uh, if that moved. So if the guard got hit here, I think the guard would just crumble. But if you got hit hard enough, it could maybe puncture through the tank there, but the way to prevent that would be weld another piece of tube around the outside so that the guard will fit in there, um, weld a tube on the outside of it so it can't actually go past that. Whoops. Um, that you can see there if I've got metal straps and I'll just make a couple of little shaped pieces of ash and if this is all correct, because it doesn't it doesn't sit up because it's got a, a round base, uh, the straps should come up the should nicely wrap around the vertical sides of the tank. Uh, if I've got the measurements correct, so the distance between that edge of the that rear cross member and that cross member there should be about the width of the tank so that the strap will go over and you put uh, sort of rubber straps around it as well. Uh, you can get that from truck supply places. They use it on truck fuel tanks. So I think that'll work. To film this wide angle to fit because it's such a small car. Um, you can see with the cutout in the instrument panel you can reach the, the gear shifter there and you can actually reach up and get the handbrake as well. So the handbrake's up there. That's... So you can get to it. Uh, not easily while you're driving, but uh, hopefully you never have to do that. And you, you really get an idea of how small the car is when, you, when you're sitting in it giant steering wheel uh, and I like how the edges of the instrument panel curve around there's no sharp edges to whack yourself on it's all nice and smooth so and my view of the gauges is kind of like that more or less uh, so you can see everything oil pressure and tachometer that's what's important. Water temperature too, but you can tell if it's overheating because steam will start coming out of it. One final thing today. I managed to take the needle and the face off the rev counter. So I'm, I'll photograph that. I'm going to have a go at making my own face. 
Uh, to get the needle off, I laid a couple of ice block sticks across it and then used another couple to sort of prise underneath it from two, two sides, sort of prise it up. And that came apart easily. And I've done the 3D print for the new back piece that's going to hold it. Uh, that's still stuck to the glass. Um, sometimes these prints stick really, really well to the glass. So I'm just going to leave it soaking in water overnight. That should soften the glue. It's just, it's just glue stick. Uh, my glass plate, I actually need to replace it because it's got a few chunks taken out of it where it's actually ripped pieces of glass out of it when I've um, removed some of the prints. But if this doesn't fall apart. You'll, you'll see how that, that will slide on there. And I just need a couple of little countersunk screws in there. And the mechanism should fit in there nicely if I've got the measurements right. And hopefully I have. So that will be the new housing for this instead of using this one. And then I can put that gauge into that body, uh, which will match the speedo. And I'll try and etch up something or get a... Uh, draw up a sticker or, you know, get a, get a sticker made or something like that. Um, I'll put this into a graphics program and extend the range around to 5,000, which should be more than enough. So I think that's the last thing, definitely. 